Limantia Disparoli Gypsy Moth. Brace yourselves for this presentation because there is so much to be said about this species. I can't imagine it isn't going to be very long. Let's discuss these moths as an interesting native and also invasive species in some parts of the world. This presentation uses copyrighted photographs and illustrations which I am actually allowed to use under the fair use law, provided their use is transformative. Worldwide, the species has a large distribution. The species is native to Europe, Russia and Asia. It's found in pretty much the whole Palearctic realm. It survives in temperate climates. The species is also present in North America as an introduced species. The habitat of this species is quite diverse, but it mainly prefers forests. It thrives in oak forests in particular. Despite eating a variety of host plants, they do have preferences. Oak tree and also poplar tree and willow are important and favored food plants for the species. The species can also sustain itself in scarcer terrain, such as the dunes. Important in this case is the presence of shrubs and trees, since this species is one that relies heavily on the presence of a good amount of vegetation, mostly in the form of woody plants. The species can also sustain itself in parks and other urban environments. Suburbs, in some cases, also have enough trees to sustain them. The life history of the gypsy moth is definitely an interesting case. But I guess that you've already experienced it live during this video. Like any moth, they go through the stages of egg, caterpillar, pupa, and then the imago, the moth itself. As you can see in this time chart, the egg stage is the life stage in which they spend the most significant amount of time. Why? That's because the species hibernates in the egg stage. From the moment the eggs are laid, they will not hatch into babies until the consecutive year, spending almost half a year in suspended development. It is only in spring, when temperatures rise after months of cold, that the little caterpillars care to wake up. After breaking through their eggshell, the caterpillars in spring start feeding on the fresh leaves of the plants. The larvae disperse from the egg case and sometimes travel all the way up the treetops. In some cases even the wind can blow them away and disperse them. After settling in the crowns of trees and woody plants, they start feeding. The larvae spend about 5 to 6 weeks feeding on the vegetation. After that they pupate. The species makes a really lazy and flimsy cocoon. It's questionable whether or not to call them cocoons at all. Using only a few strands of silk, they spin leaves, tree bark and other litter together and pupate in it. The pupal stage only lasts for a very short time, usually about two weeks. This explains why they don't invest much time in producing extensive cocoons. For the short amount of time, the pupal stage lasts anyways. And then the adults come out. The adults have a very short lifespan. And after the adults mate, the female lays hundreds of eggs and the life cycle starts again. The male and female of this species are rather distinct. Females are pale with white wings. Males are brown to gray with large feathered antennae. Both sexes do not live very long. The males of this species are diurnal. This means that they are active in daytime, when the sun is shining. During the day, males will patrol the area and fly in a typical zigzagging fashion. The females release pheromones into the air that attract males from a very long distance, sometimes up to a mile. After locating a female, the pairing lasts for about one hour, sometimes less, and then the males leave. Females lay hibernating egg masses and the life cycle starts all over again. This moth is a very notorious for being a harmful invasive species. In fact, the species was included in the top 100 most invasive species in the world. Everyone watching this video is probably very curious about this. And today I will go in greater detail about the invasiveness of this animal and the places where it has been introduced by humans. This species was introduced by humans to the United States of America with devastating results. 
It is generally believed that the first introduction occurred in the Massachusetts in 1869. Since then, the species has slowly but considerably been increasing its range over the span of two centuries. The result of this was utter devastation. In the United States, gypsy moths are capable of defoliating entire forests, stripping them of their leaves. Year after year, sometimes even results in the death of these trees with destructive consequences for the environment. This extensive damage makes it one of the worst invasive species in the United States with an appetite for thousands of plants, including 300 tree species. They are a danger to the forests of North America. The damage is so extensive that from the sky it is possible to see parts of the forest that have been defoliated entirely. While trees can often survive a single defoliation event, when it happens every year, the trees will start to die, which can lead to the destruction of forest habitat. This is really concerning. So let's investigate the effects of these insects on the environment. I'm warning you, this is going to be a long video. Of all the moth species we study together on this YouTube channel, this is one species there is a lot to be said about. The gypsy moth has had severe and long-lasting ecological, economical, historical, cultural and environmental impact. And our favorite online entomologist Bart Coppens is dedicated to present you all the accurate facts and information. And sometimes all the facts and information can be a lot. If, been watching, if you've been watching so far, then get strapped in, because this is going to be a long ride. Not many people are invested in these animals and are prepared to watch a long video about them to learn the truth about them. But you are different. You are one of the people that care. People like you and me is what makes the difference for our environment. So grab a drink, grab a snack and listen to the information. This will be a long one. Okay, let's proceed. A list of scientific sources I used for the production of this presentation. Let's proceed. Before we begin, I have to explain to you the very basics of population ecology, in particular the concept of carrying capacity and how populations grow and sustain themselves. These graphs you're looking at right now actually represent populations of organisms in an environment. The first thing that we must understand in any environment is that the amount of resources is limited. These could be food sources, for example, or territory. The more organisms of one species are present in one environment, the more they will compete over the available resources. When a new organism is introduced to a new environment, not always, but in many cases, their growth te tends to be exponential because there are a lot of available resources for the species. Let's say that you introduce a small amount of foxes to an environment where foxes were not present before. Each of these foxes will have a lot of rabbits to themselves, or a small amount of bisons to pastures with grass. For each of these bisons there will be a lot of grass to eat. This will cause the population to grow exponentially. This is what ecologists call the exponentially shaped J-curve. In this period of time, it seems as if there is endless growth to a certain species in the environment. On a graph, exponential growth curves upwards, which is why it is dubbed the J-curve. This exponential growth, however, cannot last indefinitely. The more individuals there are in one area, the more factors that will work against them. Competition over food sources, for example, as large numbers of individuals start competing over the same limited amount of food sources. Their growth will be inhibited. This is because each environment, in each environment, um, each environment only has the ability to support a limited amount of individuals. And once this amount of individuals is surpassed, the rate of growth will eventually decline until the population crashes to a level that the environment can sustain. This is known as the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is more or less the maximum amount of individuals of a certain organism a certain environment can sustain. Around the carrying capacity, typically, we expect to see natural fluctuations that hover around the actual capacity. The relationship between predator and prey is a popular example to use. 
to illustrate how numerous factors are working against population growth. Let's take rabbits and foxes, for example. Let's imagine rabbits as a very important source of food for foxes. The more rabbits there are in one environment, the more food there is for foxes. That makes sense, right? And here is the crux. The more food there is available for the foxes, the more foxes there will be. Why? Because in years of abundance, when there is a lot of food, they will give more birth and they will breed more prolifically. In essence, an increase in the number of rabbits will eventually result in an increase of the number of foxes. But when the number of foxes increases, the number of rabbits will de decrease because the foxes are now eating much more rabbits because there's more of them. Are you starting to see the connection? The number of foxes and number of rabbits is not only intrinsically linked, they regulate each other. An overpopulation of rabbits will be controlled by the foxes. And too many foxes will have trouble breeding if there aren't enough rabbits to eat, resulting in less young or starvation. And this is the beauty of population models. Populations are rarely ever, ever stable at the same level, but they tend to fluctuate, fluctuate around a certain equilibrium. This equilibrium is the carrying capacity. Populations of animals will often increase and then plummet, forming natural fluctuations. But these fluctuations do tend to gravitate around the maximum number of individuals in an environment that, that the environment can support. Why is this important? Because most of the damage from gypsy moths comes from so-called outbreaks. Just like any population of animals, their populations fluctuate. And the damage they cause to the environment is really at its worst during peak levels. The major levels of defoliation happen during the peak outbreak. Just like the populations I showed previously, Gypsy moth populations fluctuate around their carrying capacity. Whenever there is an overshoot, the populations often start plummeting and the number of individuals decreases to less harmful levels, only for the cycle to start anew. As you can see, there are numerous factors that prevent the species from proliferating, and a lot of them work against them exponentially the more their numbers start to rise. The first one on this list, for example, is food availability. This one makes sense. The more caterpillars there are in a small area, the higher the density and the higher the degree of defoliation. In some years when the moths are abundant, the defoliation is so bad that they strip all the leaves of the trees. This leaves many of the caterpillars to starve as this basically means all the food in the area has been eaten and they have to compete over it. Secondly, there are numerous pathogens. Viruses are mentioned here too. In particular, the nuclear polyhedrovirus kills a lot of Lepidopteran larvae. The higher the densities of caterpillars in one area, the more easily diseases can spread and infect larvae. So when peak numbers are happening, Mortality will also increase rapidly, and the high density of larvae allows diseases to spread very fast. The same goes for bacteria and fungi in these occasions, all of which are pathogens that are um, infectious and can jump from individual to individual. Their transmission rates will be much higher in areas with a lot of caterpillars in a closer proximity to each other. This makes these factors density dependent which means that they increase exponentially the more individuals there are and are one of the factors that start working, start working against them strongly whenever there are outbreaks. Parasites, too, are organisms that use the caterpillars as hosts and parasitism increases in numbers along with the number of larvae. Predation also increases as a high number of prey items means that predators are thriving and this also increase in numbers. Of course, there are also other numerous other abiotic factors that don't have much to do with the density of individuals. 
such as the severity of winter. Cold winter can kill the eggs of moths, for example. And unusually harsh winters can kill off of 95% of the eggs in some instances. So let's give a nice rundown of some of the major limiting factors when it comes to the gypsy moth. Viruses are major killers of Lepidopterans, and in particular their larvae. Baculoviruses in particular target a wide range of silt moths and also their relatives, such as in this case the Limantia dispar. The Baculovirus life cycle includes two distinct forms of virus. Occlusion-derived virus, or ODV, is present in a protein matrix, polyhedrin or granulin, and is responsible for the primary infection of the host, while the budded virus, BV, is released from the in infected host cells later during the secondary infection. In simpler terms, caterpillars ingest the virus that assumes an almost capsule-like form, Baculoviruses are transmitted to insects by the oral route, mediated by the occlusion-derived virus. After being ingested with food, the proteinaceous occlusion bodies dissolve under the alkaline conditions in the larval gut. Following this, the virions are liberated and proceed to infect the cells of the host organism. The larva usually die several days later after most tissues have been infected. After the larvae die, they spread virus particles all over the vegetation, and even predators and parasites that feed on them unknowingly carry these viruses with them for a long time, spreading them all over the environment. Fungi are also important killers of gypsy moth larvae. In the wild, dozens of species of fungi that target insects exist. In one particular, there is one that is, deserves attention. It is the gypsy fungus, Entomophaga maimaga. This fungus, that targets and kills larvae of the Lepidopteran kind, was found to be one of the weaknesses of gypsy moths in Japan. In fact, this fungus was endemic to Japan, supposedly, and perhaps to other areas in Northern Asia. But important to understand that it was definitely not native to the United States of America. But the United States government decided to introduce it as a means of pest control to the United States around 1985. Did it work? Yes, it did work because soon after, the cadavers of dead gypsy moth caterpillars were found in the near area. Since then, the fungus has done a good job of controlling the populations and breaking down outbreaks. However, it should be noted that this success story also came with some drawbacks. For example, the fungus also can infect and kill about 80 different native species of butterflies and moths, and maybe even more species. So while the US government successfully introduced it to destroy gypsy moth larvae, there is also some evidence that the introduced pathogen maybe also kills native species, which may be bad news for some of their conservation statuses. More information about this later in the presentation. Keep in mind that Entomophaga maimaga is not the only example of a fungi killing caterpillars, but I choose to use this one as one of the most notable examples. Also interesting is that it was actually introduced much earlier than I mentioned, but the introduction didn't really seem to work until around 1985. Suddenly, a lot of dead caterpillars resurfaced, infected with the pathogen. More information about this later in the presentation, too. There are also a number of predators that feed on both the moths and the larvae. This is a bit of a generalization, but insectivorans, rodents, birds and various insects such as ants, wasps, predatory beetles, assassin bugs, but also things like spiders, which are invertebrates, readily prey upon these moths and their caterpillars. Predators do do a good job of helping against outbreaks. Parasites too are one of the major things that contribute to their mortalities. There are numerous organisms that use the larvae of gypsy moth as host organisms, such as parasitic wasps of various kinds, parasitic flies, 
but also things such as nematodes. Of course, an increase in hosts often also results in an increase in parasitic organisms. Famously, the fly Comsilura consinata, for example, that was introduced by the United States government in order to control the gypsy moth population by parasitizing them. More information about these flies later too. There's many other examples too, such as a species of wasp called, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Oenchirtus cuvanae. Yeah, I probably messed that one up. Oenchirtus cuvanae is known to parasitize gypsy moth eggs and can reduce their populations. And that, my friends, is not all. Bacteria also play a part in their destruction. The life cycle of a moth is certainly not an easy life by any means. One example of a bacteria that strongly controls the gypsy moth is Bacillus thuringiensis. This bacteria is a pathogen that makes toxins that target the insect larval gut when they are eaten. In their gut, the toxins are activated. The activated toxins break down their gut and the insects die of infection and starvation. A lot of abiotic factors also restrain their growth, notably winter severity. While the eggs are indeed capable of hibernating, in years with very harsh frosts, over 90% of the hibernating eggs can die due to the cold. There's also a lot of other climatic factors that can be named here too. For example, flooding, which does not happen everywhere, of course. But for example, at floodplains, the mud and sand tends to burrow egg masses or drown them. And the ones that are close to the ground perish or are prevented from hatching. Now I shall represent some of the scientific sources I have used for the production of this entomological presentation. So why is the moth so invasive in the United States? This may surprise you after naming a huge number of species that prey on them, but it still comes down to a lack of controlling forces. Yes, it's true, in the United States there are several predators and diseases that are able to kill the larvae of this species too. But many of them had to be introduced to the United States by the US government for this purpose. You see, native species of birds, rodents and other predators in the United States are simply less adapted to eat these caterpillars and simply don't really prefer to eat them in a lot of cases. In Europe, all the species of birds have co-evolved with these moths for millions of years. And many of them heavily prey on them. And sometimes they even eat the egg masses of the moths as a source of food. In America, this just more rarely happens. And the number of species that like to eat these hairy invasive aliens is simply smaller. The picture in the background is for example a little owl nest in the Netherlands. And the owl seems to be snacking on a female of the gypsy moth. Another reason why they are such apt survivors is their appetite for a huge diversity of plants. Which allows them to survive in various environments. Remember the story of the hungry caterpillar? That sums up the gypsy moth caterpillars too. Their survivability is very high, for the caterpillars can eat an extreme diversity of food plants. We're talking literally hundreds of plants. This is in stark contrast to the caterpillars of many other species you'll see on my channel, for example. Because the caterpillars of butterfly and moth species tend to specialize themselves on smaller selections of plants instead. These can eat a huge, huge variety of plants compared to the average species of moth. And that gives them an advantage and allows them to spread over a wide variety of terrains as long as enough woody plants are available. 500 plus host plants have been recorded, including, but definitely not limited to, oak tree or quercus, willow or salix, poplar or populus, lime or tilia, cashew or pistachia, birch or betula, sweet gum, liquid amber, malus, pear, pyrus, cherry, prunus, hawthorn, crataegus, pine, pinus, hemlock, tsuga, spruce, picea, cypress or hemicypraeus, beech or phagus, corylus or hazel, robinia, and many, many more. However, between these plants, they do have preferences. 
For example, they don't like pine tree very much, although it depends on the subspecies. Their favorite host plant by far seems to be oak tree. Oak tree, in particular, is very important for the abundance, density and populations of this species, especially the European subspecies. In forests with a lot of oak trees, this species thrives very much. They love oak trees. This species mainly dominates an oak forest. Northern oak forests are a perfect and often preferred habitat of this species, and the more oak trees are present in the forest, the higher levels of outbreaks can be. So now we had this rundown, let's finally investigate the damage and the impacts of this invasive species. In what ways do they impact the environment? And is there anything that we can do against it? Let's attempt to quantify this a little bit. So how bad is the damage? Well, since 1970, more than 83 million acres have been defoliated by the gypsy moth in the United States. In total, this is a surface area that's bigger than the size of Arizona, which is by comparison 72 million acres. That's an extraordinarily large amount of forest that has been defoliated by an alien that doesn't even belong there. Invasive species are one of the major threats to our environment today, as of the 21st century. So what is defoliation and why is it bad? Let's dive into this. Tree defoliation hurts the forest in several ways. The good news, however, is that trees usually survive being defoliated once. It's when it consistently happens every year that it can lead to tree mortality. Being defoliated once does, however, make the trees more susceptible to secondary pests, drought and poor growing conditions. The resilience of forest environments to withstand external pressures and stress factors when combined with defoliation drastically decreases. This in a modern day and age, with factors such as climate change and deforestation affecting the overall health of forests, combined with pressure from invasive species, can lead to tree mortality and overall decline of forest cover. During severe outbreaks, Trees and shrubs are completely defoliated over large areas. Despite the tree's ability to produce a new crop of leaves over the summer, the damage causes substantial growth loss. Understory shrubs may also be affected. In most areas and in most years, gypsy moths remain at low densities and actually cause no discernible damage. But in extreme situations, 100% tree mortality may occur over large areas that have consistent outbreaks and defoliations. Even worse, the gypsy moths are expanding their range. It is estimated that more than 30 million hectares of forest in the United States have been defoliated since 1970. The potential area that is climatically suitable for the gypsy moths is estimated to be 595 million hectares. The species, even after two centuries, is still slowly expanding their range. Here I present you some of the sources that were used to produce this scientifically informed presentation. Let's attempt to quantify the impact that these insects have on native wildlife. Tip, it's bad. Every species when introduced to an ecosystem has countless of tiny interactions with native species. Some positive, some negative. Let's attempt to quantify some of the ways which these moths affect species that are native to the United States of America. Gypsy moth larvae feed on over 300 plant species during the summer, hindering the tree's ability to create food. When oak trees lose leaves early during the growing season, they will abort their acorns resulting in less food for wildlife to eat in fall and less oak regeneration. Acorns, or acorns, I don't know how it's pronounced, acorns produced by oaks are eaten by many birds and mammals, including deer, squirrels, mice, rabbits, foxes, turkey, grouse, quail, woodpeckers, and many more during the fall and winter. Acorns make up about 54% of a deer's yearly diet. When acorns are not available as a reliable food source, the deer and other animals may have to look elsewhere for food. 
Acorns are also an important energy source during the winter due to the high carbohydrate concentration. Since acorns make up over 50% of a deer's diet, they lose a very important energy source which could hinder survival if less acorns are available. The loss of food in reserves is prevalent in the populations of preferred game, deer and turkeys, and also negatively impacts hunters who may make a livelihood from such activities. As a result of gypsy moth defoliation, oak trees experienced a loss of 7.1 square meters per hectare in 2008. Young oaks and hickory have also seen a steady decline in health. This results in an inability for forests to perform one of, to perform one of their most important ecological roles, serving as carbon sinks that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The amount of carbon able to be removed from the atmosphere due to forests expanding and growing when compared to a loss due to defoliation, is outweighed by a ratio of 5 to 1. Trees not being able to remove as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere can lead to an increase of carbon being left in the atmosphere, which poses other problems. Another negative effect of gypsy moth defoliation of trees is that defoliation leads to a higher rate of tree infection by opportunistic pathogens. Opportunistic pathogens are defined as bacteria, viruses or fungi that take advantage of an opportunity that is normally not available, such as a host with a weakened immune system. Gypsy moths feed on leaves, leaving open wounds for which pathogens may readily enter the plant. Gypsy moths have also been shown to consume more plant material under drought-like conditions, adding more stress to an already drought-stress tree. For example, Amarilla root rot is a common root and bud rot pathogen that is a forager of weakened trees, killing only weakened or stressed hosts. Amarilla has been associated with the high mortality of oak species, that are stressed by gypsy moth defoliation. Some trees may never be able to recover as a result of acquiring another infection on top of already being defoliated. Defoliation also has a negative impact on birds, since defoliated trees can provide less canopy cover and expose the nests. The exposed nests can cause an increase of birds being preyed upon or an increase in predation rates. The defoliation from the larva typically affects the predation rate of birds in that area, resulting in about 20% increase to predation rates. In moderate years of defoliation, it is responsible for a 10% decrease in canopy cover. Years that have a higher abundance of gypsy moths could have a higher percentage of decrease in canopy cover which in turn will lead to an increase in the predation rates of birds. More birds being preyed upon decreases their populations, which leads to a decrease in biodiversity of the local bird populations. There is also a strong correlation seen between the decline of cavity nesting bird populations and defoliation. Cavity nesting birds include woodpeckers, swallows, wrens and nuthatches. All of these species are important insectivores that play an important part in the insect control of the ecosystem. A decrease in these ecologically important species will ultimately lead to a rise in the number of insect pests that are seen in a forest. Defoliation is not the only hardship gypsy moths impose on the ecosystem. The introduction of invasive species can lead to a decrease in biodiversity or variety of species in an area. This is accomplished through competition between gypsy moths and the native caterpillars living in the area of outbreaks. Gypsy moths can increase the mortality rate of native caterpillars, such as the northern tiger swallowtail. Their mortality increases to 100% when they feed on quaking aspen leaves, 
painted with gypsy moth larval fluids. This increase in mortality rate can decrease the abundance of northern tiger swallowtails. Another study in northern oak forest shows abundances of gypsy moths among native species average about 75% in some areas and can increase to 96%. Particularly, there are decreases seen in white marked tussock moths and forest tent caterpillars, which are native species that belong in these areas of study. Due to the gypsy moth's preferred species of tree being oak, they compete with a number of other caterpillars that feed on oak tree, which includes crank worms, linden loopers, leaf miners, oak worms and web worms. The specific species mentioned here are just some of the caterpillars affected through competition with gypsy moths. In reality, many other species, hundreds of species in different areas of outbreaks are affected. Wow, a decline of birds, a decline of deer and other herbivores, a potential decline of native trees, and even a decline of native butterflies and moths. Who would have known that just one species can have such a devastating impact on a broad range of animals? Anyone who supports the environment understands how destructive, invasive and introduced species can be driving our natives, native beloved species to decline or even extinction. Not to mention the cost, the economic impact, the damage that these moths cause and measures to limit them, their spread or to eradicate them, cost the United States economy $250 million per year. Oaks are important tr timber trees in much of the Northeast, and gypsy moth infestation can result in tree death, growth losses, and changes in wood quality, which all have direct secondary effect on timber values. Standing timber degrades quickly after tree death, causing losses up to 25% within five years. Last but not least, infestations also affect tourism, for tourists may avoid visiting the affected areas, on top of which the state often has to provide for preventive measures and pest control, which again funnel a lot of money that the government has to spend on damage control. It's incredible to think about the massive impact that even one person can make by just being irresponsible with their non-native insect species that they breed. The good news is that the impact this species has had on the human health is not very large. And I quote, Gypsy moth hairs do not cause severe adverse side effects to human health unlike oak processionary moth caterpillar hairs. However, as with all hairy caterpillars, the hairs are potential allergens, although symptoms vary depending on an individual's susceptibility. So it seems that the hairs of this species are not classified as toxic or highly irritant. Despite that, it does seem they can be potential allergens and may trigger skin rashes or allergic reactions to people who are sensitive to the hairs. When infestations happen and the caterpillar levels are high, the presence of hairs that can carry it by the wind may be a detriment to people who have a sensitive immune system. It is time to display some of the sources that were used for the production of this scientifically informed presentation. So what has the US government done to prevent the spread of these malicious insects? Let's give a rundown of some of the preventive measures that have been put into place to try and limit the spread of the gypsy moth. No, this is not a picture of the Vietnam War, of the United States dropping Agent Orange. It's a picture of the war against gypsy moths. And this helicopter is dousing the vegetation in DDT, a potent pesticide that thankfully is not being used in the United States anymore today. Since their introduction, a lot of things have been tried to prevent the moth populations from growing even bigger and to keep their numbers in control. Now in the presentation, I will summarize some of these methods, which is not easy to do because there is so much information to discuss and even a summary will be very long. But I have spent months of reading and research on this presentation and I summarized most of it. Commonly used against gypsy moths is a pesticide named Diflubenzuron. 
The flu benzuron disturbs the normal molting of insects and other invertebrates by interfering with the deposition of chitin, preventing proper formation of the cuticle. The good news is that deflubenzuron does not seem to be very harmful to organisms that are not invertebrates. This is important to remember, because a lot of general pesticides tend to be toxic to literally every type of plant and animal. Affecting wildlife as a whole, with a lot of sad collateral damage. Deflubenzuron, however, only targets invertebrates and in particular their larval stages by interfering with the molting process with deadly results. This means that thankfully other vulnerable wildlife such as vertebrates could be spared from any harmful effects. Deflubenzuron unfortunately does negatively affect non-target populations of invertebrates. It seems to be highly effective against aquatic invertebrates in particular, and the most sensitive in general appear to be crustaceans. Therefore the use of this pesticide must be thought out carefully. Species such as crayfish, crabs and their relatives are vulnerable to this pesticide, but also beneficial insects such as bees or pollinators are adversely impacted. Now each pesticide comes with its own pros and cons. And while it looks like this pesticide can be pretty bad for non-target species of native insects and other invertebrates, important to note is that unlike many other more broad spectrum pesticides, it is less harmful to things like vertebrates, which may make it a more attractive option. Unfortunately, pesticides rarely come without any form of collateral damage. Carbaryl is another major pesticide that is used in the fight against gypsy moths. It kills both targeted as well as beneficial insects. It is often applied by aerial spraying, for example mixed with oil. It is the third most used pesticide in the United States in general and approved for use in over 100 species of food crops. It is the active ingredient in carin Carilderm shampoo, which is used to combat head lice in, until infestation is eliminated. It is classified as a likely human carcinogen in the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Interestingly, the pesticide is illegal in Europe. It is very effective against gypsy moths. In some instances, reductions of 99% of the gypsy moth in the area can be reported. Which is a lot, and if true, is a quite good result. Carbaryl is used as an insecticide on corn, soybean, cotton, fruit, nut and vegetable crops, as well as in home yards and gardens. Carbaryl is also sold under the trade name Savin. The advantages of carbaryl are several. Yet again, this pesticide thankfully has a low level of toxicity to vertebrates. Although toxic to insects, carbaryl is detoxified and eliminated rapidly in vertebrates. That means in terms of damage that it does to the local wildlife, at least vertebrates and other non-target organisms will have less collateral damage. This is a benefit compared to pesticides that harm more organisms in general. It also has a low level of bioaccumulation and does not persist in the environment as long. This is good news because some pesticides can bioaccumulate and end up through the food chain. Carboreal is broken down pretty fast, which means there will be most likely not any long-term damage to the environment. As for the downsides, carboreal is dangerous to humans. Exposure can induce comas, respiratory failure, blurred vision, convulsions, nausea, vomiting, potential liver and kidney damage, and it's also classified as a potential carnisogen. That means there is a chance it can give you cancer. Most importantly, however, it is that, of course, it is a pesticide that is rather harmful for any other invertebrate. Designed to kill insects, there is a lot of collateral damage among the insect populations. Native species of butterflies and moths will also be destroyed, as well as many other pollinators and other invertebrates, such as crustaceans. Tebu phenozoide is an insecticide that acts as a molting hormone. 
It is an agonist of the ecdysone receptor that causes premature molting in larva. It is primarily used against caterpillar pests. For those who didn't study entomology, ecdysone is the molting hormone in insects that trigger skin shedding. In fact, molting is also known as ecdesis for that reason. It's related. Tebuphenoside appears to be highly specific to Lepidopteran larva. All things considered, that's a pretty good thing. Because of this, this pesticide does not seem to affect native insects as much, apart from the Lepidopterans, which are the targeted pest. Tebu phenozoide is used against numerous types of Lepidopteran pests, such as gypsy moths, tent caterpillars, budworms, tussock moths and cabbage looper. This makes it a much more environmentally friendly alternative, as opposed to pesticides that are harmful to all invertebrates in general. In fact, it has even won the Green Chemistry Award as an environmentally friendly breakthrough that will help re reduce the collateral damage against wildlife through pesticide application. While all of this sounds like good news, of course it is not good news for native butterflies and moth species. While this pesticide seems to spare most other invertebrates, which by the way is great, native species of Lepidoptera are still negatively affected, and if it's not used cautiously, this may hurt endangered or threatened species of butterflies and moths. It is time to display some of the sources that were used for the production of this scientifically informed presentation. Biocontrol or biological control is a method of controlling pests, mainly by using their natural enemies against them. These natural enemies can include anything from predators to parasites, diseases, fungi, bacteria, viruses and others. Essentially the practice of using the natural enemies of a pest against them. Biocontrol is one of the most environmentally friendly ways of controlling pests. Of course, if it's done right. Oh hey, do you remember Bacillus thuringiensis? I mentioned them briefly earlier in this presentation. This is a bacteria that targets and kills the larva of insects in particular. This bacteria is a pathogen that makes toxins that target insect larvae when eaten. In their gut, the toxins are deactivated. The activated toxins break down their gut and the insects die of infection and starvation. Bacillus thuringiensis also occurs naturally in the gut of caterpillars of various types of moths and butterflies, as well as on leaf surfaces, aquatic environments, animal feces and insect rich environments in general. The bacteria can be cultivated and mixed with a liquid, then sprayed over crops or affected areas with Lepidoptera and pests. It is currently the most commonly used biological pesticide worldwide. Spores and crystalline, crystalline insect proteins produced by Bacillus thuringiensis have been used to control insect pests since the 1920s and are often applied as liquid sprays. They are now used as specific insecticides under trade names such as Dipel and Turicide. Because of their specificity, these pesticides are regarded as environmentally friendly. These bacteria are also known as Bt bacteria. Good news! Bt bacteria are mostly environmentally friendly. Well, mostly. It has no effect on humans pets, wildlife, or even plants. Food crops won't absorb it and it won't stay in the ground. It is a naturally occurring organism. And all of this is pretty good news. That means it is not detrimental to the health of humans and many other animals, unlike other pesticides. Unfortunately, it is an efficient killer of butterflies and moths. And many endangered and native species can be negatively affected by them. For example, in Europe, Bt bacteria are being sprayed in areas where pine processionary caterpillars are present. For example, in Spain. Unfortunately, here in some locations, they, stare, they share their habitat with a very rare and endangered Spanish moon moth, Graelsia isabella. Because of this, the rare species could decline because of this bacteria that is being used to control a pest that feeds on the same host plants. This, my friends, is bad. 
And for example, in the 1980s, mosquito control sprays with Bt bacteria were suspected to be killing no-target Lepidoptera, including the endangered schouw swallowtail butterfly in Monroe County in the Florida Keys. The schouw swallowtail butterfly is protected as an endangered species by the Federal Endangered Species Act. Less than 2,000 of these butterflies remain in the wild. Therefore, even as specific as Bt bacteria are, unfortunately, they are not without collateral damage and should be used carefully in areas where rare and endangered butterflies and moths remain. The Callosoma sycophanta, or forest caterpillar hunter, is a species of ground beetle. It is present in most European countries, and this ground beetle is a voracious consumer of caterpillars, especially the caterpillars and the pupa of gypsy moths. In 1905, it was important to New England for control of the gypsy moth. It is also really pretty, with an iridescent exoskeleton that has all the colors of the rainbow. Both the adults and the larvae exclusively feed on caterpillars of several kinds, especially on hairy caterpillars such as processionary caterpillars and a gypsy moth. Interestingly, the larvae of the beetle are also predatory and feed on caterpillars but also pupa of moths. If the introduction of the beetle helped control the numbers of gypsy moth in America is disputed, disputed. Some studies have shown positive results, for example. One study showed that during one instance of an outbreak, over 70% of the caterpillars on the lower parts of the trunk of the trees and 40% of their pupa were destroyed, although pupa and caterpillars that were higher up in the trees were affected less. Other studies, however, show that gypsy moth survival, um, pupal survival was high when predator population densities were also high. This is not what would be expected if Callosoma sycophanta were controlling the pest. So the results are a little bit mixed. The beetles probably do help reduce their numbers somewhat, but definitely not enough to prevent outbreaks. The good news is that the beetles breed and persist in the habitat and form a continuous form of control. There is also some limited evidence that the beetles may be vectors for diseases that help eradicate the gypsy moths. Hey, do you remember this little guy? This is Compsilura consignata, the parasitoid native to Europe that was introduced to North America in 1906 to control the population of an exotic forest pest. You guessed it, the gypsy moth. In a year, approximately three to four generations occur, and the females of these uh, flies inject caterpillars of several butterfly and moth species with their larvae. The larvae then remain as internal parasitoids and slowly consume the caterpillars' insides before bursting out, pupating and turning into flies. What makes this species of parasitoid successful on numerous host species is its ability to have a flexible life cycle. It has the ability to alter its life cycle based on the host it inhabits. This introduction was a huge mistake. The fly was introduced because it parasitized caterpillars of the gypsy moths, but miscalculations were made. First of all, the fly is multivoltine, while the main target of its introduction, the gypsy moth, is univoltine. Since the host, of the host uh, organism, the gypsy moth, overwinters as eggs, the parasitoid fly found non-target species in which to overwinter. Due to its flexible life cycle, this parasitoid can parasitize more than 150 species of butterfly and moth in North America. To make things even worse, it typically only parasitizes less than 5% of the gypsy moths during an outbreak. The collateral damage is pretty bad. Research on giant silk moths suggests that Compsilura consignata has become the major source of mortality among several species and may be responsible for the notable decline in their densities that has occurred over the last century. This is because giant silk moths are very vulnerable because of their long-lasting caterpillar stages that can sometimes even last up to 60 days. In some areas, the flies parasitize between 30% up to 80% of the native silk moths making them an enormous threat to their conservation. Compsilura consignata is a multivoltine insect. 
It completes a first generation on Gypsy Moth and has two or three subsequent generations on other Lepidoptera, whose larvae are present in late summer. This fact may link the dynamics of these different species. An outbreak of gypsy moths may lead to higher levels of parasitic flies, since more gypsy caterpillars means more parasitism. When a generation of gypsy moths has pupated, the flies move on to other hosts, while their levels are elevated by the pest that they took advantage of. Yikes! Entomophaga maimaga, the gypsy fungus, is a killer fungus that targets and kills the caterpillars of gypsy moths. Deliberately introduced to the, by the United States government, while it was originally native to Asia, this fungus is pretty effective and in some cases managed to decrease the levels of defoliation by 85%. Presence of Entomophaga maimaga may be determined by late instar gypsy moth larvae which when infected with this fungus, die, hanging vertically from tree trunks with prolegs extended laterally. The cadavers subsequently fall to the bases of trees. Although Entomophaga maimaga was introduced in the United States from Japan in 1910 and 1911, its first 1989 appearance in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, Northeastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Southeastern New York and Massachusetts is a mystery. If its presence is due to the original introduction, then why wasn't it detected during the years between 1911 and 1989? Either way, since its presence was established based on lab results, Entomophaga maimaga appears to be quite specific to the family that includes gypsy moths although it can cause low levels of infection in a number of other species. This means that the amount of collateral damage it inflicts in non-target species is actually quite low. Only relatives of gypsy moths, such as other native tussock moths, are affected by the fungus. In low levels, unrelated families are affected too, such as leopard moths and some noctuids. But out of hundreds of dead gypsy moth caterpillars, only one or two of them are non-target species. In a 1995 study of Entomophaga maimaga released against gypsy moths in residential areas, only the control plots had high levels of defoliation. Data from 1996 indicates that gypsy moth defoliation declined more than 85% from 1995 levels over 11 states. The most dramatic cases in Virginia were um, 1996 defoliation was non-existent compared with 85,000 acres in 1995. Entomophaga maimaga, however, has been highly variable and unpredictable. Consequently, the use of environmentally safe and effective insecticides will continue to be important tools to reduce damage caused by gypsy moth outbreaks. But it's nice to have biocontrol on the side. Oenchirtus guvanae is a species of parasitic wasp that parasitizes the eggs of gypsy moths. It was introduced to the United States in the year of 1908. They parasitize the eggs of several species of insects, however, not only gypsy moths. Curiously, they've also been found parasitizing the eggs of the red-spotted lanternfly, a recent invasive species that has showed up in the United States. It is thought that these parasitic wasps do make a basic contribution to keeping population levels down. The collateral damage to native species, however, is not very well known in terms of scientific quantification, as far as I could see. If you know more about this species and its effect on native and invasive moths, leave a comment. I would be curious to learn. It's hard to find information. And now I present you some sources of this scientifically informed presentation. If you are still watching this video after all this time, then you are a champion. Personally, I can talk about moths for hours, but usually I restrain myself from doing that. That's because my audience will get bored if I keep talking about moths for hours. They don't appreciate it. But only in this video, I am using 100% of my brain instead of 1% of it. That's because this species is very important to the environment and their natural history has many lessons that we can learn about invasive species. So today is today I have to use all my knowledge 
and give a complete rundown. Don't forget to take breaks from YouTube people. Anyways, you can watch it in parts. Apart from biocontrol, there are several other methods to control gypsy moths, some of which are more practical and others more manual in nature. Let's review them. Mating disruption. Mating disruption is the, wait for it, disruption of their mating. This is done with artificial pheromone lures. These pheromones just smell like the females. Males cannot tell the difference. As most of you know, male moths are drawn into the smell of females that release a volatile compound, pheromones. As however turns out, scientists have figured out how to synthesize pheromones. These pheromones are then placed in a pheromone trap. The traps have a sticky, glue-like substance. And while the males are attracted to the smell, they enter the trap, then stick to the glue, after which they are stuck and eventually die. Mating disruption is somewhat environmentally friendly, because this method of pest control truly only affects the targeted species. If you have been paying attention to this presentation, it's obvious that nearly every pesticide does come with some forms of collateral damage, unfortunately. But pheromones are thankfully highly specific to only the target species. Only males of gypsy moths are attracted to the pheromone of females, and thus, only male gypsy moths are caught in a trap. And then, of course, we have things such as egg moss scraping. Eggs, egg mosses, can be scraped off trees or other items into a container with soapy water which will kill the eggs. Note, if you simply scrape the egg mosses on the ground, many eggs will still be able to hatch the next spring. Egg mosses are a small cluster of eggs that range in the size of a dime to a little bit bigger than a quarter. Egg mosses can contain anywhere from 100 to 1000 eggs. They are tan or light brown color and have a soft, fuzzy look to it. These egg mosses are typically found on the trunk of the tree anywhere from ground level up to above 60 cm above the ground, which is typical. However, they can be anywhere along the trunk. They are also commonly found on the underside of branches and in the crevasses on the tree. Although less commonly found, the moths will also lay eggs on the leaves and on other nearby objects such as firewood, outdoor furniture, fences and even the sides of sheds and houses. The effectiveness of this method is however most likely not very high. Manually removing individual egg masses will not bring a systematic change in population levels. Given the incredible amount of insects in our surroundings during outbreaks, which are typically way more than any amount humans can individually catch or remove. It may however help remove some of the moths from your very local region, such as your backyard, or perhaps your garden. Tree bands are yet another method people have come up with. Tree bands usually have a smooth surface that the caterpillars are unable to climb leaving them unable to get up in the trees in order to feed from the leaves that they crave. That or the tree bands sometimes even have a type of sticky surface that will trap caterpillars when they come in contact with the glue. Although it helps remove a lot of caterpillars from the immediate area, it generally does not significantly reduce the overall population. If you are curious about some of my sources, I present you some of them for further research and rearing, reading, not rearing. I hate my accent sometimes. So how was the species introduced to the United States? Surprisingly, it was done by an entomologist that we know by the name of Etienne Leopold Trouvelot. Trouvelot had an interest as an amateur entomologist. In the United States, Silk-producing moths were being killed off by various diseases. 
Trouvelot was very interested in Lepidoptera larva, including native North American silk moths, which he believed could potentially be used for silk production. However, for reasons that remain unknown, Trouvelot brought some gypsy moth egg masses from Europe in the mid 1860s and was raising gypsy moth larvae in the forest behind his house. Unfortunately, some of the larvae escaped into the nearby woods. There are conflicting reports on the resulting actions. One, state, one states that despite issuing oral and written uh, warnings of the possible consequences, consequences, no officials were willing to assist in searching out and destroying the moths. Other notes, however, say that he was aware of the risk and there is no direct evidence that he contacted government officials. So who knows? Either way, shortly following the incident, Trouvelot lost his interest in entomology and turned again to astronomy. So yes, one can say that one of the worst invasive species of the modern era was introduced somewhat deliberately by one, deliberately, by one single person. Although their escape and spread to the United States wasn't really a part of the plan, and may have even considered to be accidental in some regards, it's interesting to think about the fact that it was a breeder of moths that raised them in captivity, actually just like me, that let them grow out of control. I don't think there is any other way to illustrate how much responsibility exotic pet owners should have and why it's necessary to have regulations in place that prevent people from importing any species they like. What's even more puzzling is that Trouvelot was supposedly breeding them to look for an alternative species to produce silk. Which is crazy considering the fact that gypsy moths hardly produce any silk at all, ironically. There are several subspecies of the gypsy moth too that are of particular interest. The subspecies also have subtle differences in their behavior and ecology. Let's dive into the most relevant ones. Limantria dispar dispar is the European gypsy moth. It's the same insect that we have been breeding together in the beginning of this video. It is native to Europe, West Asia and Northern Africa. This is also the subspecies that had primarily escaped in North America and is the original invasive species that was first introduced. Interesting about the European gypsy moth subspecies dispar dispar is that the females barely fly. Instead, they often prefer to be immobile, choosing to sit and lay eggs in the vicinity of the location where they have eclosed from their pupa. This means that European gypsy moth females don't really disperse. Instead, larval dispersal behavior plays a bigger role. Research has shown that compared to other gypsy moth subspecies, the caterpillars of the European gypsy moth are much more inclined to show nomadic behavior, wandering to other plants that they prefer to eat instead. They prefer oak tree, but they do have a huge list of host plant lists that they can use. It's important to remember that the European gypsy moth is almost practically flightless, because it means they tend to disperse much less, and they rely more on habitat persistence and the nomadic behavior of the larva. Limantria dispar asiatica, or the Asian gypsy moth, is native to temperate Asia, east of the Ural Mountains. There are subtle differences in their appearance, such as the more pale males with the darker wing costa. But the most important difference is that females are much more inclined to fly. The biology and ecology of the both the Asian and European forms of Limantia dispar are similar. The primary differences are that Asian female moths can fly up to 20 kilometers, that is 12 miles, while European female gypsy moths are more or less flightless and rarely stray very far from the place where they pupated. And the Asian strain has slightly different host plant preferences than the European strain as well. The Asian gypsy moth, for example, has a great appetite for larch or larix, salix or willow and alder or ulnus. 
This is a subtle but very important difference because the Asian gypsy moth is also or used to be present in the United States much more recently, as recent as 1990. And their preferences for different trees means that outbreaks could have different characteristics and the subspecies could defoliate different habitats than the European dispar dispar. It is also concerning that the females are much better at flying, which means that disinvasive subspecies will be much better at spreading themselves around the country and dispersing much faster. Then there is Limantria dispar japonica, the Japanese gypsy moth strain. They are also similar to the European and Asian subspecies, but again show some interesting differences. For example, research has revealed that this subspecies often prefers to lay eggs higher up in the trees. The European and Asian subspecies often oviposit their eggs about one meter above the ground on the lower part of the tree trunks, but the Japanese subspecies has been documented laying their eggs very high up in the trees. Interestingly, they also really like to oviposit on birch tree and seem to have a bigger preference for birch tree in general than the other subspecies. They can also defoliate large persimmon and Japanese sedar trees. Females are highly capable of flying. Here is a comparison between the three relevant subspecies we discussed today. All three of them of course look very similar, but the Asian subspecies are a little bit bigger than the European subspecies. Namely the females have a much greater size. The European subspecies has tiny females in comparison. The Asian subspecies are a reason for concern when it comes to the United States of America. This is because of their different ecology and behavior. We have already established that the European gypsy moth subspecies, the Limantia dispar dispar, often abbreviated to LDD, is an extremely harmful forest pest that is destructive to the Dicuous oak forest. That's why the fact that there are other subspecies that prefer to eat other trees as well is scary to think about. Why? Because they could destroy entirely new forests that European gypsy moths do not affect. In fact, their tendencies to infest different habitats could mean that the destruction could happen in conjunction. For example, the Asian subspecies could pose a threat to coniferous forests that are rich in larches but also humid forests where a lot of willow trees are present. The Japanese subspecies also defoliates persimmon and other plants. On top of that, the females of the Asian subspecies are much better at dispersing themselves. You see, one of the greatest limiting factors in the invasiveness of the European gypsy moth is their very limited ability to disperse. They are quite an immobile pest. The females practically suck at flying and rarely do so. The European subspecies relies more on the caterpillars dispersing than the imagos do. However, the Japanese and Asian subspecies are quite agile flyers and some sources mention the females are able to disperse over distances of 12 miles. This is scary to think about, considering that if these species became invasive in the United States, they could spread so much faster and would be so much harder to control. Even worse, the Asian subspecies already became invasive in the United States several times between 1991 and 2005, which raised a lot of red flags. Massive pest control efforts, however, have presumably helped eradicate the Eurasian subspecies in the United States for now, and as of today, right now, they are presumed to be extinct in the United States. But you never know if they can return. Small populations can in fact be eradicated before they grow out of control if they are detected early. Because the US government is still very wary of these subspecies. Even worse, some experts believe that these subspecies could hybridize if both of them or more are present in one area. Considering they are just subspecies, there is a chance they could create fertile offspring. Imagine this, a hybrid of the European and Asian gypsy moth 
that inherited the Asian moth's ability to fly and the European moth's ability to feed on oak tree and show wandering behavior and the Asian moth's ability to defoliate coniferous trees, willow and birches. Every parent can tell you that children have the tendency to inherit the worst traits of their parents. A European Asian super gypsy moth hybrid is the last that we are waiting for right now. Although gypsy moths tend to remain in the host trees for most of their lives, they are able to fly. As well, can be transported by humans. Colonies typically move from place to place when they are in search of new forests to defoliate. Two of the subspecies differ in terms of their ability to fly. Asian gypsy moths are able to fly long distances and can spread very quickly. European gypsy moths are more incapable of flight and therefore take a much longer time to spread. However, the European gypsy moth's ability to fly also seems to be a curious case, because actually the European subspecies is not completely flightless either. It varies per population and per individual, because some populations are actually somewhat good at flying, while others are flightless. I remember raising some females from Poland that were actually exceptionally good at flying. I found a scientific study online to prove it. Inheritance of female flight in Limantia dispar. A clinal female flight polymorphism exists in the gypsy moth, Limantia dispar, where female flight diminishes from east to west across Eurasia. A Russian population where females are capable of sustained ascending flight and a North American population with females incapable of flight were crossed. Parentals, reciprocal F1 hybrids, double re reciprocal REF2 hybrids, and all possible backcrosses to both the parents' parental lines were compared. Heritability of female flight capacity was measured, and as it turns out, flight capacity in the European gypsy moth is actually heritable to some extent. Relative wing size, muscle strength, and pre flight behavior are inherited and regulated through certain genes. Interestingly, it seems that some of the alleles needed for full flight capability may not be present in the North American populations. Continued vigilance to exclude and eradicate introductions of strains that are capable of female flight in North America is warranted. Turns out that some gypsy moths don't have the genes that make females great at flying. These genes are possibly not selected against, since they rely on habitat persistence, and dispersing may not always be an immediate advantage. It's simply, simply an evolutionary trade-off between flight capa capability and reproduction. First of all, having functional wings and a muscle mass to support these wings and flight costs energy. In fact, having any bodily function or organ in the first place costs energy. The absence of wings or the muscles to support flight simply allows greater allocation of resources to egg production instead. But we have to ask ourselves, in potentially what circumstances is laying eggs an advantage over being able to fly? The answer is, in a habitat in which you don't need to disperse. That's right, not just resource allocation, but also habitat persistence is one of the important factors that make flightlessness an adaptive advantage. In stable habitats where the species can reproduce without an urgent need for dispersal, there is less selective pressure when it comes to functional wings in females. Not many American scientists are aware of the fact that some European gypsy moths, Limantia dispar or LDD, can actually fly. A flight polymorphism exists, but genes that allow flight seem to be absent in the United States population. Interesting, huh? Oh no! Racist alert! Controversial headlines lately. I quote, This moth's name is a slur. Scientists won't use it anymore. The Entomological Society of America will no longer refer to common species of insects as gypsy moths and gypsy ants, for example, because their names are the gatory to Romani people. Some people, since recently, have been offended over the name gypsy moth. Gypsy refers to the Roma or Romani people with Romanian origins and originally of Indian descent. 
They speak Romani, which is a language similar to Hindi or Persian. When the Roma left India in the 11th century, the Europeans mistook them as Egyptian. This is where the term Gypsy comes from. Some of the history associated with the word is not pretty. The Catholic Church restricted Roma from purchasing land. The Hungarian and Romanian nobles enslaved the Roma during the 15th century. In the 15th century Germany, the government ordered average citizens to kill gypsies living among them as well. Eastern Europe, Spain and Italy expelled the Roma, forcing them to disperse through Europe. Eastern Europe freed them of slavery in the mid-1800s, but the Scandinavians launched a sterilization program against them in the 20th century. In these times, Europeans often used the word gypsy as a racial slur throughout these centuries to justify the discrimination and persecution of the Roma people. It's crucial to understand that these origins have a direct negative impact today. In fact, 90% of the Roma still live below the poverty line in Europe. They have a high infant mortality rate and life expectancy is at least 10 years shorter than other Europeans, according to Amnesty International. They often work odd jobs because of a lack of opportunities. Some people who identify themselves as ethnically Roma, called Romani or Romani, are offended by gypsy. And most standard dictionaries have reservations about using it to mean Roma. On the other hand, research has also revealed that some Roma people don't mind being called gypsies, and others even embrace the term. Important to know is that the word by itself is not inherently offensive, but it often became offensive because it was often used contemptuously and in a degatory way. Scientific names are important to me, but common names are not. They are trivial. And so I would personally embrace a new name for this insect, especially if people don't feel discriminated by it. Me and my channel are against discrimination. In fact, I myself struggle with a lot of things that I am constantly judged for by others. For example, I have a somewhat severe form of autism that makes it hard for me to function in a traditional workplace or study. I have a preoccupation for moths, which is actually one of the symptoms of autism. People with autism spectrum disorders develop an intense, very narrow field of interest such as learning obsessively about computers, TV programs, movie schedules, lining objects in straight rows, or particular things such as lighthouses, trains, or collecting sticks. In my case, it has always been moths since I was very young. I cannot stop thinking and talking about them. This talent is also a disability and a compulsion of mine, but YouTube allows me to monetize it. On the internet, my disability is actually a talent. However, due to some of my antisocial behaviors, obsessive and narrow interest in moths, my nonconformity and fruity personality and appearance, I myself have often faced discrimination, loneliness and rejection in my life. And it hurts. On the other hand, I am not an ethnic minority and I'm, I am what I would consider to be a Caucasian white male in the Netherlands. So I don't claim to have experienced racism or discrimination based on my ethnicity, thankfully. And I am not saying this so that I can make it about myself and be the victim here. I understand that having a developmental disorder is different from being an ethnic minority that people discriminate against. But my point is not that I am a victim too, just like the Romani people, or that I understand what racism feels like. However, I do know what it feels like to be discriminated against for things that are beyond your own control, or basically for being the way that you are since your birth. And it sucks when people use your identity as a slur or as an insult. Whether it people call you a gypsy or an artist, it is something that you have no control over. And I can relate to that feeling somewhat. Therefore, if there is any social change and people decide to use a different name, I think I would support it. So why am I calling them gypsy moths all the time in this super long video in which I say the word gypsy moth hundreds of times? 
I mean, if you count how many times I say the word gypsy in this video, it's probably hundreds of times. Is that not offensive and hypocritical if you're aware of the problem? Well, my issue is that no new name has been published yet. People complain that the old name is problematic, but the old name as of today is still the official name. People that want to find information about this insect are still googling the word gypsy moth all the time. And I can't just make up a new name for them myself right now. As a YouTuber, it's important to me that people searching for information about these insects are redirected as traffic to the video that I have made about them. If I make a video about coffee, but I title it Bean Water, no one will find my video. If I make a video about monarch butterflies and call them orange flappers, no one will find my video on Google or YouTube. If I make a video about jellyfish, but I decide to call them sea puddings in my video, no one will find my video. And for me it's important for people to find my video and find information about these insects that they are looking for. That's how I get views. And for me this is more important than to avoid using the offensive name. Please keep in mind that the word gypsy moth has been used for decades, if not centuries. And I don't think this video is going to change that fact for now. So for me it was just really important to include this discussion so people are aware of it. And I think it's very important to agree on a new name in the first place before we stop using the old name. Because now it's left in limbo. Overall, the impact of this species on the environment has been grandiose and devastating. Some afterthoughts are appropriate here. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. By far the longest and most epi educational episode of Moth Cycles. Usually this web series is more focused on breeding moths, making it more fun and entertaining, and showing their life cycle from egg to adult moth, giving them a rundown of the species and its ecology. This episode, however, was a little bit excessive in regards to the species rundown. In fact, this is probably the most detailed species rundown in the discussion part of the web series Moth Cycles I have made so far. Why? Why so long and detailed? That's because this is just a very important species for our society, both economically, culturally, ecologically and ethically. There is just so much to say about gypsy moth. Anything from their history of becoming invasive, to learning important lessons about invasive species and their consequences for the environment. As a person that himself also likes to import various exotic species from time to time, and maybe has even inadvertently helped promote the practice of importing exotic moths. So things like sustainability and invasive species are a very important moral and ethical theme for my channel. All the way to clearing up the many misconceptions about gypsy moths and their population ecology, quantifying their impact on the environment scientifically, to the discussions and debate about racism and their common name, to their interesting life cycle and several ways they can change forests and impact human health and economies have changed legislation. There is just so much to say about this insect. In fact, I try to keep it short. Originally, this episode was twice as long, but I cut most of the content because I figured there's not many people who have attention to watch the video for that many hours. But it is also my duty as an online entomologist to present you all the facts as accurately as possible when relevant, so that you have been educated to the best of my ability. And I don't think there are any other moth species in the world that have had a bigger impact on our society than the gypsy moth, an iconic invasive species, the introduction of which has had major ramifications for politics and economy. Educating people about insects is more than just a passion. It is also my job. That's right, it's my part-time job. So in situations like these, I take the liberty to make my content as extensive as possible. However, because of this, I do have a very big problem. My channel is demonetized by YouTube and I don't make any money from creating and uploading even such massive and thoroughly researched YouTube videos. And because of that, sometimes it can be really hard for me to keep going. But I have a dream, and even if I am demonetized, let me proceed to explain before, because we really need your help to continue.